72. Yeah. I'll just wait till 03 and then we can get going. Seventy-five. <clears throat> okay, it's six oh three, and we have seventy-five participants. So I think it's okay to start. <laughs> okay. All right. Oops. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, hello, thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Erica Berman. I am marketing and membership manager and a board member at Delaware County Historical Society. And on behalf of our board, staff and volunteers, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our online conversation tonight, civil rights and school segregation in 1960s Chester, PA. Our mission since 1895 has been to collect, protect and preserve the diverse history and culture of Delaware County. And as a historical organization, it is important that we highlight the significant and difficult period. Understanding the history of discrimination and segregation in Delaware County is key towards embracing the challenges of today. Um, so just a quick no notes before um, we get into panelist introductions. Um, this event is being recorded and a recording of it will be posted to our website after the event. Um, we will be accepting questions from the audience through the chat um, which we will be uh, addressing after our panel Q&A. Um, so if you wanna put your questions in the chat, we will get to as many as, of those as we can um, after our panelists speak. Um, so now I would like to pass it off uh, to our panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, we'll start, we'll do alpha order. We'll start with Chris Smelly. Hi, I'm Chris Melly. I am a sociologist and an urban uh, geographer, and I've written a book on Chester called Race and the Politics of Deception, and happy to be here. Thanks. Uh, Twyla? Oh, hold on one second, Twyla. Okay. Good? Yep. All right. Uh, good evening. I'm Twyla Simkins. I'm a retired school teacher and I live in Chester. Um, I'm also a former board member with the um, Historical Society. And I'm glad to be here and share what I can. Thank you. Um, let's go with Jordan Smith. Hey everybody, I'm Jordan Smith. I'm an assistant professor of history at Widener. I teach early American history, African American history and public history. I'm currently collaborating with students on a project called History and Memory in Chester, where we're trying to combine archival research with oral histories to create community accessible content on Chester's history. Um, so this is my chance to plug that if anybody's interested in hearing more about that project or getting involved, uh, please email me or call me. Uh, Len? Okay, my name is Len Warren and I am uh, happily retired. <laughs> from uh, a lot of places. The last one was a substitute teacher at Sprayberry High School in Marietta. I did that after retiring from IBM as a marketing rep. And I was born and raised in uh, Jacksonville, Georgia. After high school, I joined the United States Army and uh, spent three years there. Worked for Boeing Aircraft for about seven years. No, longer than that, about 15 years. And so I'm just an all around guy. I do a whole lot of things and say a lot of things that uh, are true and untrue. But anyway, I'm just happy to be here with you guys today. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I'll pass it off to our uh, moderator tonight, Stefan Roots.
unmute. There I am, Stefan Root. I'm your moderator tonight, so that basically means just get out the way and let the program begin. But by way of background, I'm best known around these parts as the Chester City journalist. I'm born and raised in Chester. I'm on the board of the Delaware County Historical Society, and we decided to do a program via Zoom because we can't do it live. Looking at the number of people here, I wanna just welcome all of you. I'm glad you see this program as something of interest, civil rights and, and school segregation in the 60s in Chester wasn't an easy topic to come up with. We knew we wanted to do something in the 60s. And then we really realized after some discussion that the 60s is kind of complicated in and of itself. I mean, there were, there were the Vietnam protests, there was Martin Luther King, there was John F. Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, there, was, there were all these uh, civil rights laws. So we had to kind of whittle it down into something that you're going to be uh, presented with tonight. And we've got a phenomenal group of people who are going to share. A Widener professor, an author of the latest Chester book. We've got a couple former resident, well, a current resident and a former resident of Chester who can give us some on the ground experiences of what they went through in the 60s. So without further ado, oh, and in the 60s, I was born. So I didn't know a lot that was going on in the 60s. Okay, I was born in 1961. So all I knew about the 60s was uh, kind of like first through eighth grade. So this is going to be an education for me as well. You know, whenever I can learn about those, those early years of my childhood, it's, it's really fascinating to see how far we've come in my lifetime. So this is gonna be just another one of those great experiences tonight. So let me look at my schedule here. Um, we're gonna start with Chris Mele. He's going to share with us a historical background, 20th century Chester racial Chester. tensions. This should be really interesting. Chris, take us away. Sure, thank you, Stefan. Um, so my task here is to kind of set up uh, the situation in Chester in the first half of the 20th century that would then lead to uh, Jordan picking it up with the period of the early 60s around the issue of, of school segregation. So, I mean, it's almost impossible. I really don't wanna take up too much time because the focus is obviously on the 60s. I just wanted to play up a couple of things that, uh, and remind people, I'm, I have the uh, strong belief that, that much of what I'm gonna talk about that uh, we all are familiar with, but, I, what I want to emphasize is uh, the kind of systematic nature of segregation uh, in the first half of the 20th century. And I want to um, really kind of focus on the aspects of it of, uh, embedded in people's lives in an everyday situation, where you uh, shopped, where you lived, where you ate, where you attended movies or plays, where you shopped, uh, where you um, went grocery shopping, um, and of course, where we went to school. And I think the one thing in terms of my doing research for my own work is that um, whereas a lot of the uh, United States, especially in the North, was um, slowly moving towards a, an effort to integrate, uh, one of the, the features of Chester was the amount of energy, money, resources, and time that was spent to avoid integration, integration, maintain and reproduce segregation. I think that's important to note because we have this kind of notion of uh, things changing in an almost inevitable sequence, but really Chester's uh, not, except, not ex unique, but is somewhat exceptional in its, um, again, being fixated on maintaining at all cost um, segregation at every level. So. In terms of the forms of segregation, I just want to quickly go over uh, three elements, uh, housing, employment, and education. Uh, when it comes to housing, I think it's important to note that um, as the Great Migration, which was the influx of African-Americans from uh, mostly rural South during World War I, that tapered off a bit during the Great Depression that picked up again for World War II associated with wartime industries, that as African-American, of course, families and folks moved into Chester, um, they were slotted into specific neighborhoods as we would expect. 
to the eighth and ninth wards. But the important part of it were the boundaries that were maintained and kept with those neighborhoods. Uh, the expansion as the population grew was very difficult, if not impossible, at certain time periods. When we start to have the beginning of public housing, that too is systematically segregated. Although the Chester Housing Authority in the mid 50s abolishes on paper segregation and racially segregated public housing, it continues well into the 1970s that we still see a vast majority of public housing uh, kind of segregated on the, on the basis of race. As uh, Chester changes demographically, and you have, of course, the expansion of Delaware County suburbs, the political machine uh, based in Chester expands into Delaware County and really carves that up into uh, predominantly a white space. So making it very difficult through a number of different tactics and strategies from issuing of permits to racial steering and blockbusting efforts and things of that nature to maintain, again, this geographical kind of housing segregation system that was in place. When it comes to employment, uh, there's a number of cases at play. Perhaps the most known, of course, is Sunship with yard number four. And uh, Franklin Roosevelt, at the uh, onset of the war effort in June 1941, issued an executive order uh, calling for um, the integration of wartime industries uh, and employment at the end of employment segregation for those companies that have government contracts. Sun took the kind of novel approach of integrating its industry by creating, oddly enough, a separate and segregated yard for shipbuilders known as yard number four. And you know, there's a variety of reasons for that. And there's a lot been written on it, but one of the dominating reasons was to basically uh, union bust the, at the time, an early formation of a shipbuilders union and uh, creating kind of racial tensions to distract from unionization efforts. So employment in general, um, of course, was as well um, highly segregated and controlled by that same political machine uh, on a basis of, of course, um, a number of issues, including race. When it comes to education, we have uh, in the first half of the 20th century, of course, segregation. Later on in the, uh, in the 1940s and 50s, it's up to the ninth grade. Uh, the 1946, the school board in Chester, uh, again, on paper, um, gestures towards integration. 1954, of course, we had Brown versus the Board of Education. And the response that the school board has is to put the emphasis on neighborhood schools so that wh where you lived puts you slotted into a particular type of school. Well, as you can well obviously see that if you have segregated neighborhoods, you're gonna have segregated schools. And the capacity to undo that uh, was very much defended against by uh, white parent unions, especially, uh, and, and, and school-based organizations in the white dominant schools. The, uh, as the black community did expand and kind of chip away at the edges of neighborhoods uh, that were uh, white, but as white folks were moving into predominantly suburb suburban communities, you see the school board redrawing those maps to again, reflect the racial dynamic of white and black. I wanna kind of just then set the stage for uh, turning it over to our next uh, presenter by talking about, there were quite a few efforts, of course, in the civil rights movement pre-1960. Uh, they're often labeled as being gradualist, meaning that the pace was very uh, measured, if not as critics might later on say, slow, uh, but the efforts were primarily institutional, relying on legal challenges, relying on influence amongst politicians in the community and in the county, and relying on efforts to uh, influence the school board, especially when it comes to the issue of education. Uh, the two dominant figures, of course, were J, uh, J. Pius Barber from Calvary Baptist and George Raymond, who was the head of the NAACP. They're very successful in a number of desegregation efforts, theaters, restaurants, some stores, uh, and when it comes to school, it's a mixed bag. Uh, again, there are some wins, but then uh, often retracted. 
wins in terms of legal changes and challenges and also administrative, but then losses when it comes to pushback primarily from white families uh, trying to make maintain the segregation within the school system. So the, the kind of um, reputation of Barber, of course, was very high in the community, both amongst blacks and whites. And jo George Raymond, again, working with Barber, was able to, again, accomplish quite a bit in a, using a more gradualist, kind of slow bake uh, embeddedness of an effort to undo segregation efforts. That, of course, changes when we get to the 60s, and that's where I'll stop. That's what you call a hard stop. <laughs> <laughs> I know no oh, other. <laughs> yeah, you, you kind of caught me off guard there. You were on a roll, Chris. <laughs> For those of you who are wondering, how does this man know so much about what's going on in Chester, Delaware County in particular? He wrote a fabulous book. I call it the and it truly is the latest book on Chester history. It's called Race and the Politics of Deception, colon, The Making of an American City. So it's really nice that Chester has been considered an American city. We've been called a lot of things. This might be the first time we've been called an American city. Uh, just real quick, uh, Chris, I know we got to move on, but uh, t Give the uh, audience just a quick blurb about your book. It's a fascinating read. We've talked about it several times. I always complain that the first couple chapters were too academic for me to understand, but once I got into it, it was a fabulous read. Uh, give us a quick uh, synopsis of your, of your book and where they can find it. Oh, okay. Uh, well, you can always find it on Amazon, of course, like you can find everything, right? Um, <laughs> except uh, a COVID uh, vaccine, uh, but the, book itself is from NYU Press, uh, so the date was from 2017. Basically uh, what the book does is try to take, uh, it starts with the whole question of the waterfront right now and development going on the waterfront and then situates the historical context that leads up to this kind of crazy period of the 1990s and 2000s where you have, uh, I guess put it mildly, mixed development along the waterfront. If you can call prisons, casinos, soccer stadium and a waste incinerator, mixed development, I guess that's what you could call it, uh, that, you know, what is the context for and setting that up? And so I trace uh, through 100 years of how uh, the situation discourses and language around race and racism has actually shaped the discussions about the path that uh, Chester took. And, um, and that's uh, where it stands. I am now working with Stefan, Twyla, and many others to uh, kind of focus on um, a community-based effort of storytelling where folks are not unlike what we're doing here, where folks are going to be sharing their stories, which um, tragically and, and uh, rarely have been captured and preserved uh, in any systematic way. And so we're trying to kind of create a, a basis for uh, all that experience and memories and knowledge that Chester has to be uh, preserved. Thanks hey. everyone, for allowing me to plug. Well, I see a comment here from Zuleen Mayfield who says you, you've got to get to the photocopy machine because they're sold out on Amazon. You've got to restock the shelves out there, buddy. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> One thing I love about, about Chris is that, you know, he wrote this book on Chester. Nobody knew who he was. Most of us didn't even know he was writing a book. The book kind of snuck up, snuck up, snuck up on us. But the beauty is he has not finished his work with this book. As he pokes around Chester, he kind of often continues many of the, the topics that he talks about from just hanging out with people like us and, and hearing our stories. So the storytelling project that he's talking about is really going to be the continuation to what I hope is part two of this book as he uh, continues on. But that's enough with you, Chris. I got to move this thing <laughs> on to Jordan Smith, Professor Jordan Smith from Widener University. He's going to present a timeline of events during 1963, 1964 with the slideshow. So I, I, let's go. Let's get our popcorn out and see what Dr. Smith has for us.
All right, I'm going to make you listen to me before I show the slideshow for a bit. But well, that's our pleasure. Kind of following up on on what Chris said, um, you know, it, it's a strange feeling to be presenting on kind of the protests themselves on this uh, panel because I'm uh, the person who hasn't written a book on it and did not live through the events. Um, but what I think I can bring to the table is my vocation as a historian, and what that means in this context is finding and reading records of this event evaluating the evidence, reconstructing what happened, and reflecting on what all of it means. So in the next 15, but I'll, I have to apologize to our, our organizers, it's probably gonna be more like 20 minutes. I'm gonna um, go through kind of those different um, points. What follow, follows does not purport to be the history of the Chester protests, but a history of Chester protests. And I think that's important because different people have had kind of different experiences with that. And I think it's really important for us to kind of value those experiences, to bring in oral histories, to kind of collect these stories. Um, I, that's something that I think everybody on the panel is interested in doing in different ways. Um, but I will say a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is coming from kind of archival records that I've uh, worked on uh, pulling together. So Chris gave you a sense of the state of the civil rights movement in Chester prior to 1964. Um, I want to kind of go into a little bit more detail about what Chester was like at that point. Um, just I think that can give us a, a jumping off point. It was a city of 63,000 people undergoing profound changes like many cities that had prosper prospered during the wartime years. White flight was in full force. The white population had decreased about 15% in the previous two decades, and African Americans now made up 40% of the population of Chester. Poverty was creeping in. 50% of families were making less than $4,000 per year. Relatedly, the average adult in Chester had completed fewer than nine years of schooling. The average in Delaware County as a whole was 12. The schools were shaped by these dynamics. There were 11,000 students, 60% of whom were African-American. Because of those hard fought earlier victories, the high school had been fully integrated. There were 11 elementary schools, three of which only taught African-American students, two more of which were almost all African-American students. Those schools tended to be in older buildings, were overcrowded, and only one of the five had a kindergarten. Chris's presentation reminds us that these were not new concerns, but the urgency shifted in the 1960s. And there are two reasons for that, one local and one kind of more national, I would suggest. Locally, people became impatient. Stanley Branch, who split off from the NAACP and formed the Committee for Freedom Now, embodied this new urgency. He stated that in an interview in early 1964, Quote, we are going to be free and we are going to be free now. We're not concerned with what's going to happen in 68, 69, or 70, end quote. This new sense of urgency was not necessarily compatible with long drawn out negotiations with the school board or county or city committees. And I would add too that Branch is associated with this immediatism, but the movement really was bigger than one personality. Um, at its core, it was grassroots. It engaged mothers of elementary school students, families, certain religious communities, and the students themselves. Um, in some ways, I think um, I, it has sometimes been described as um, branch being the match that lit the powder keg. Nationally, similar movements were taking hold too. It seems that inspiration for what happened in Chester may have come from an eerily similar school protest in New Rochelle, New York, three years earlier. And really the points of comparison are striking. It was kind of a mixed race school district where African-American students were sent to crumbling schools. Um, families began kind of their uh, more direct action by boycotting schools like they did in Chester. And if Chester would ultimately be dubbed the Birmingham of the North, New Rochelle had already been known as the Little Rock of the North. And as an aside, these nicknames were used to kind of um, try to shape public opinion kind of on the side of protesters, convince um, kind of Northerners who might not have really been looking at school segregation in their own communities um, that uh, the protesters were on the side of, of kind of these movements that many Northerners were more likely to kind of get behind. 
So anyways, a lawsuit coming out of New Rochelle gave parents of school children a glimmer of hope. A federal judge ruled that purportedly race neutral school boundaries reinforced segregation and thus needed to be redrawn. The ruling was affirmed on appeal and the New Rochelle school in question was shut down in 1963, right? An important year in the story that we're telling as well. So activists could look at many other cities and say something similar. And it seems that that is in some ways what, Chester, what activists in Chester said. In joining this fight, they made school segregation, which at least legally had often been a Southern issue into a national issue. And so um, protests in the fall of 1963 centered on the Franklin Elementary School on Concord Ave between the third and fourth. The school had been built for 500 students, but was now serving 1,200 students. There were an average of 39 students per class, inadequate toilet facilities, the library consisted of a desk with a few piles of books, and the old coal bin was being used as the gymnasium. I'm gonna to try to start to share my screen here. Um, somebody can kind of interject if you can't see my screen. Um, but again, these issues have been brought up to the school board and to other kind of city officials previously. We start to see a rise in tensions in November of 1963. On November 9th, parents of school children organized a school boycott. And this is something I want us to think a little bit more about. For this sort of direct action to work, it requires a critical mass of parents, and at least in the household I grew up in, mothers, to sign off. Those parents and students also picketed outside of the school. Um, on November 12th, the Committee for Freedom Now continued to tighten the thumb screws on school officials, uh, blockading the doors of the Franklin School. On the 12th and 13th, a total of 230 people were arrested at the school and the municipal building. Sorry, I'm having trouble advancing my slides here. Sorry. One second. Okay, um, so again, 230 people uh, were arrested on the 12th and 13th of November. And ultimately, um, Branch and Mayor Eyre reached a truce. The city agreed to transfer some students to alleviate overcrowding and make some improvements. And they also agreed to drop charges against the protesters. Uh, the tumult continued in, the, in early 1964 and I would say that the city's response became less conciliatory with the inauguration of Mayor Gorby. Protests continued over the gerrymandering of elementary school boundaries and the segregation of teachers. That is that African-American teachers taught in African-American schools. So another round of school boycotts in February led to 55% absence rates in affected schools. Um, in March, the Chester Human Relations Commission advised integrating the elementary schools the following fall. However, the school board refused. They claimed that any racial bias was legal because it was unintentional and based on where people naturally lived in the city. And they also refused to meet kind of solely with the civil rights groups at work in the city. In light of these developments, uh, members of the Committee for Freedom Now, the NAACP, and the Philadelphia branch of the Congress on Racial Equality joined in protests. Those taking to the streets initially tended to be young in their teens and 20s, largely residents of Chester, but also local college students from Cheney State, uh, the Pennsylvania Military College, which is now Widener, and Swarthmore College. Certain religious communities also uh, were involved in organizing this movement. Again, one big takeaway is that the strength of this movement was its people. Now, escalation began during Holy Week um, of 1964. There was a large rally of between 100 and 300 on the evening of March 27th. 
Um, this crowd blocked traffic late in the evening at Fifth and Market Streets. And in kind of a, of a harbinger of things to come, uh, there were three arrests associated with people blocking traffic. Um, Gorby made it very clear um, in his actions uh, that he was going to arrest people if they impeded traffic. Uh, the following day on March 28th, and um, we'll just kind of look quickly on the map. Um, uh, this one happened at 7th and Edgemont. Um, but um, the following day, um, 30 to 35 people in their 20s or younger um, held an organized sit-in at 7th and Edgemont. Here are some of these great photographs. They'd been trained to go limp when city and state police tried to remove them. We got some more images here as well. Um, this is one of the many places where the accounts of police and protesters diverged. Um, it's possible that one or two protesters abandoned some nonviolent techniques, um, but that's, no, that's absolutely not a sure thing. What we, do, what we do know is that going limp infuriated the police. The Delaware County Daily Times reported the next day that club swinging police halted a racial sit down at the busiest intersection in this city this afternoon. The police openly beat protesters, including a 22 year old Chester resident and recent PMC grad named Walter Bryant. Um, they kind of hit them in the streets and um, allegedly as they dragged them to police cars. As protesters um, languished in jail, a period of near daily protests began. To make up for the shortfall of officers, the city was deputizing other municipal employees as special police. And this is another kind of technique that um, often doesn't end well. Uh, the main charges lobbied against these protesters were things such as blocking traffic or entryways to schools, um, generally being quote, no loud, noisy, and disorderly. That appears repeatedly in these reports. Um, and then on several occasions, throwing stones or, or bottles at police. Now with kind of these uh, wide scale arrests, the protests morphed in some ways. They were still absolutely about school issues. They also came to kind of uh, represent a response to the continued imprisonment of protesters. In Chester, one magistrate judge was handling all of the court appearances. Um, he was not accepting bail expeditiously. He was giving people the runaround in other ways. This resulted in overcrowded and inhumane conditions in the jail. And protesters saw this as the city holding people prisoner as a ransom to stop demonstrations. But they would not be deterred. Um, the protests hit another kind of stage in late April. On April 22nd, uh, protests um, resumed at schools. And protesters got inside schools, including uh, Douglas Junior High, Dewey Mann, Watts, and Booker T. Washington. A rally that evening at uh, Temple Baptist Church was held. And there were a series of protests afterwards. Uh, the most notable kind of for what we're gonna be talking about um, was at the mansion of Republican machine leader, George McClure, um, which was located, located um, uh, yeah, right up here on Providence Avenue near the Widener campus. By 10 p.m., 300 people had congregated there. They were singing freedom songs, chanting, and clapping. Um, you can see again, a, a relatively young crowd, uh, male and female, largely African-American, um, again, kind of protesting. Because of the size of the crowd, they were spilling off of the sidewalks, um, and there had, uh, which the police classified as trespassing. And there had also been some property damage reported earlier in the evening. But police kind of brought in city buses and began rather aggressively mass arrests. And somewhere around 120 people kind of were arrested. A reporter for the Philadelphia Evening Bulletin named Timothy Tyler suffered a broken nose and lacerations and was subsequently arrested. He was initially denied medical attention. The state report commissioned in the aftermath noted, quote, grave suspicions are created, however, when authorities appear to fear the eyes of the press. It's something for us to kind of keep in mind as well. As those arrests transpired, action shifted uh, to the police station 
uh, later that evening. And the event uh, kind of descended into something close to pandemonium uh, when city lights went out on certain streets around um, the police station. Um, some protesters were hurling bottles and rocks at police. Police were, of course, um, swinging nightsticks indiscriminately, hitting both kind of uh, people exercising a peaceful right to protest, um, people who might have been throwing objects at police, and also people just trying to observe what was going on. Um, they, the police chased protesters. Uh, there are claims and reports of police yelling, run, N-word, run, as they swung. Two days later, the protest refocused in African-American neighborhoods. Many of the leaders of the protests had been arrested and were, remained in jail at this point, which led to some organizational efforts. But that uh, day, um, protesters blocked traffic at 3rd and Pusey. The police responded and were hit with bottles and stones, um, some uh, showering down from overlooking windows and roofs. Um, the police began chasing after their assailants in an undisciplined manner, and non-protesters were kind of increasingly getting caught in the crossfire. There are additional accusations that police were hitting handcuffed prisoners on a bus used to transport them. Um, and the police also charged into a, ba a bar called the Bull Moose, and patrons uninvolved in the protests were hit by club-wielding police officers. All told, kind of this was um, the high watermark in some ways of a series of protests which led to 600 arrests and 40 injuries. So I'm gonna, uh, uh, with that, those, those are kind of the images we have, so I'm gonna end my screen share. Um, all, this kind of gives us a chance to kind of pause and ask what kind of was accomplished with these protests. The sustained involvement from community members kept the attention of the local and national press on the issues being discussed. Um, it meant that accusations of police brutality were investigated. The governor's commission report, which I've quoted from several times uh, today, was ultimately fairly measured, if conservative in its analysis. For instance, it reserved judgment whenever there were conflicting reports, and it criticized some nonviolent techniques used by protesters. Nonetheless, this report noted breakdowns in police leadership and training. It cataloged aggressive policing techniques, and it ever identified several instances of outright police brutality. No major uh, police reforms followed, as far as I can tell. Um, I'm happy to be corrected if I'm wrong. But it's possible, and I would say likely, that this report itself shielded protesters from some adverse outcomes, including prosecution. Two days later, the Pennsylvania governor, William Scranton, agreed to hold hearings into de facto segregation in Chester as well. The Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission began hearings on May 4th at Pennsylvania Military College. Right, so we see kind of uh, the speed kind of picks up in, in kind of how issues are being addressed. That November, one year after the, these protests began or kind of hit another level, the Human Relations Commission ruled that Chester School District was guilty of discriminatory practices. They stated uh, that the district needed to immediately open kindergartens in all of the affected schools and desegregate the schools prior to the start of the 1965 school year. It took three more years until the Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruled that the Human Relations Commission had the authority to compel this desegregation. But within one week of that ruling, the school board agreed to eliminate or substantially reduce the racial imbalance. However, the process remained, and in some ways remains, incomplete. It took four more years until criminal charges against the protesters were thrown out in 1971. So I want to end, and I know I'm way over time, with three takeaways that I want us to think a little bit about. The first is that events in Chester were part of an important movement to nationalize the civil rights movement. And this public battle used both direct pressure and the courts to expose and redress discrimination nationwide. The second thing is that the movement's strength came from the individuals who participated in it. They made decisions based off of personal experiences 
and their own views of what a better, more just society would look like. And the third thing is an important one as well, that the protests were effective. Sustained protests drew attention from the press and forced major investigations into police brutality and segregation in the schools. Progress remained slower than many wanted, but direct action moved the needle in ways that the school district had previously resisted. Is that another hard stop? That is. Oh, okay. Oh my God, that was fascinating. I'm sitting here like biting my nails. You, you took us through a journey that I'm sure many of us have never experienced. There may be a few out there who have witnessed it. That was compelling. That was earth shattering. That was revealing. Uh, you, you told a story there. I'm, I'm kind of shook up here. I, I, I gotta kind of gather myself. I, I was looking at the timeline and matching it up to my age at that time. So I'm looking at, you know, age two, age three, age four, age five. And I, I can share that I didn't know any of that stuff. I mean, that history, of course, the elders, you know, experienced it, but they surely didn't share it. And it's, I don't know how to feel about just learning about much of what you told me, you know, at this stage of the game. But that's the reason why we put this together. We knew this would be a compelling program. We're, we're, we're recording it. We want this history to be shared. You did a phenomenal job, Jordan. I also want to say that uh, the work you do at the university, um, sharing this history with your students is, is very unique. You know, you've got that program where you're going to be working, I think, with three separate uh, classes in succession. And they're taking a piece of Chester history from, from these periods and chronicling it and putting it together. T tell us just a little bit about that project and how it works, because um, this, this is not the end of, of Jordan. He's, he's, Dr. Smith is, is on it. Let's go. Tell me, tell me what you're doing with the, with the students. All right, I'll keep it really brief, but I've been kind of working um, with a class this past fall, which most of the panel came in and talked to my class, which I'm very appreciative of. Um, and uh, they, they were they're kind of in the process of working on a, a traveling museum exhibit that could be kind of shown at different kind of places within the Chester community. Um, retelling kind of this story of, um, of kind of protest in uh, 1960s Chester or mid-century Chester. Um, they're also, I'm kind of working on, there are several kind of manifestations of the project. Uh, we're also looking at using kind of technology to tell some of these stories. We're really interested, the students are um, in kind of collecting oral histories from community members who'd be willing to share those stories with them. Um, so it's it's still getting off the ground running. It's very much a student-led effort, um, but um, I think there's a lot of history to be told here, and I think we can learn a lot about um, both kind of the community in which kind of we're all a part of, um, but also kind of wider kind of trends in, in U.S. history. Thank you. Before we move on to our other two panelists, uh, someone brought up in the chat that in the photos they saw William Dandridge. And for those of us who know William Dandridge, he has a very distinctive face. It was great to see William Dandridge at such a young age. And there's no surprise that he was on the front line back then. The other thing that was put in the chat, if you missed it, is that all the photos that Dr. Smith showed us are available. Uh, they're available uh, from that link. And I think they're all at the Delaware County historical society. And finally, you guys sure are chatty. You know, if this was a live event, I'd be shushing all of you right now. But I guess through the power of Zoom, we can chat and ask questions and share information. So make sure you're, you're following the chat because some really good stuff is coming out of there. All right, now let's move into the part that I'm really excited about. We've got Ms. Twyla Simpkins, we've got Linton Warren. These are people who are gonna give us some real life experiences. And in the interest of time, please Twyla and Len, just keep your remarks to maybe two minutes. And I'm gonna assign the questions to uh, each of you as I deem appropriate. So for Twyla, do you remember schools being segregated as a child and uh, were your teachers black, white, or, or both? All right, um, both. Let me show my shirt very, very quickly. C-Pride. 
and thank everybody who's here because I saw several people that I invited. Um, I, my my bottom line is that I was I was like thirteen, so I went from all black do man to integrated Pulaski, and that admitting people. Yeah. And then I just want to show a couple of things. Um, I want to make sure that that chapter rights in particular and anyone else interested can identify with what's happening. This is a picture of, uh, if you can see it, the glare, but a picture of uh, Malcolm X, Stanley Branch, Gregory, and this was taken. The old, um, oh, it's it's a it's a son of call. Oh, your street third work. And it's just a landmark that's that's centigrade. And then coincidentally, a friend of mine just sent me this Dewey Man Star, which was a newspaper that we put when I was in sixth grade. And it has all black people in it. So then I went from an all black school in Dewey Man to a very, very white, predominantly white school at Pulaski Middle School. So that's your next question. Thank you. Thank you for that. Your audio is just a little bit choppy. I followed it, but if anybody has any questions on, on what she said, just, just put it in the chat. Okay. Um, um, do you recall experience, experience yeah. of segregation outside of the schools, uh, Twyla? Yes. Um, I was in a unique position where my dad was, was an alderman, a magistrate. So a lot of people came to our house needing help with a variety of things. And so it was very um, normal to see any number of people, including dignitaries from the city. And so as the political unrest was happening, there were people coming to my dad asking him to intervene. And I just remember in particular, my dad said one morning, he called my sister and I to get together. And he said, some things happened today. Your mom will be um, arrested and lose her job. And your brother is going to be arrested too, because my older brother was out picketing, and my mother, a school teacher, was also out picketing. So as I grew up, I just was made aware of a lot of those things. So kind of being the only one in my class in Pulaski, having to always kind of be on top of things because there was no one who had my back when I was in in seven P or whatever that was at Pulaski. So yes any number of things. And then going to high school was the same thing. Walking through certain neighborhoods, looking at schools and seeing like, why are our schools looking like this? When other schools are, you know, are looking different. But we were encouraged to, to ask questions and, and think outside the box to try to look for solutions as well. Next. You just kind of messed up my little spiel when you told me I had two minutes. So that's why I'm waiting for your questions. All right, here we go. I lost audio for a moment. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. I'm getting feedback, so hold on here. Nicole, it's technicalities. All right. Well, while you're just to interject, um, one of the things I found fascinating too was that I was 13, and within eight years, I was a teacher in a plan school district. And it was just such a mind boggling experience trying to figure out how best to serve my young people. And that was my challenge. And 35 plus years later, I decided that I had enough. But I continue to do it in my current capacity, which is to uh, run the girls, the old girls why, and keep it as a, as a repository. And I see that the um, historical society is really in sharing that they have um, a lot of documentation. And I just have to throw in that I do too. But mine looks like me. So unfortunately, I could not find a lot of resources. So I started creating my own, gave my own. So just a shame of my little yes center. And um, hopefully 
my contact information will be included in the um, as well. All right, thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. yes. All right, thanks. All right. Lenton, it's your turn. Step up to the plate. I want to hear what your memories are of the protests and, and how did they impact you and, and your family if they did at all? Well, uh, the protest didn't affect me that much because I was sort of new in Chester. I came to Chester in 1959, October 1959. And uh, I just joined in with everything that was going on. I never had any problems outside of the protesting. I didn't attend any any uh, schools in Chester. And uh, my involvement was like a protest. I was always involved in the protesting. I don't know why I can't turn my phone off. Just I'm not give me a minute you. here. <laughs> it just won't go off. <laughs> You're supposed okay. to answer it, that's why. No, I got it. I hope I have it off now. Oh, but okay. anyway, I was uh, I was always involved in the protest, but uh, I never was attacked while I was protesting except one time, and this was uh, we were we were marching from I think we assembled about Seventh and Edgemount Avenue. It was called Edgemount then, what is now Avenue of the States, I think it is. But anyway, that's where the assembly was. And then we were marching. We were instructed to march up uh, through the business section of Chester. And the thing that was so, that we didn't expect, we didn't know anything about, they were going to block off all the streets. But the policemen were on horses mounted horses and uh they blocked off the far end of of uh the street down by where city hall is now and uh all the streets that were crossing that area that uh, uh edge mount what was that called then it was anyway market street what was it market street it's, yeah, it's Market Street now. It's but anyway, Avenue, of, Avenue of the States now, Market Street Yeah, then. it was Market Street then, Avenue of the States now, right. So anyway, they blocked off every entrance to that street and the end of it down by City Hall. And they had a bus across the end down at where uh, City Hall is now. And the doors were open, the front and the rear doors were open on the, on the bus. So they had the mounted police after we were got into the area where we were marching down Avenue of the States, they were like herding us forward. You couldn't go turn around, you couldn't go left or right. And the buses were parked up there with the doors open and they were herding all of the protesters, all of the marches that they could get into the buses at that point and hauling them off to what was called Broad Meadows Prison at the time. And when one bus get loaded, they would bring another one right in behind it. So I got caught in that, in that uh, forcing. And uh, I had a policeman on my left, a policeman on my right, forcing me to get on the bus. So when I'm, I'm thinking about what, how am I going to, keep myself from getting on this bus. So I put one foot on the left side and one foot on the right side and I was pushing back on the policemen. They were pushing me forward, I was pushing back. So I, uh, I said, okay now, let me, let me think about what I'm doing here. So they were pushing hard this way, the two of them, and all of a sudden I just gave away and both of the policemen fell forward. And uh, when they fell forward, they lost contact with me. There was one on the right shoulder, one on the left shoulder, and, and the arms, of course. So I just ducked down under one of them and just ran. I ran away, and I was, I was determined that I was not going to jail. All those folks that were boarding those buses, they went to jail. 
that night. So that was the only time I was in a confrontation actually with the marching, but I was always out there protesting. I learned to stay like in the middle of the crowd, you know, like if they were marching down the street, I would, I would sort of hang in the middle. I wouldn't be on the front and I wouldn't be on the end so that I could sort of determine what was going on. And uh, if it got too rough, I would, you know, sneak out and go back home. But uh, I never did get involved in any confrontation other than that particular one. But, uh, and I never had any real problems in Chester, except, you know, knowing what was going on. And uh, I married a teacher in Chester, Georgina Williams at the time. And uh, I got all the news about what was going on in the schools from her. And uh, she wasn't very pleased about how it was, but you couldn't get her out of Chester. She loved Chester. And uh, <laughs> she stayed there until it was almost time for her to retire, I think. But we finally got out. I, I convinced her to let's move to Delaware. And at this time, I had started to work for uh, IBM. And I got to know all of all outside of Chester, what was going on. So I moved to Claymont, Delaware, and uh, lived down there for about 15 years before I went to work. Uh, I was working out of the Wilmington office and the Philadelphia office back and forth. And I got relocated to Georgia in 92. And that's how I got back to Georgia. But uh, as far as any other and I heard the name Stanley Branch mentioned. Stanley Branch was the organizer of, of most of the uh, action as far as desegregating Chester was. It was him. He was the one that came down from Philadelphia and did most of organized. I happened, there was only about, this was, this was the main purpose of the uh, protesting outside of the school not being seg not being integrated was that that weren't any african americans uh, african american people working in the business area they were there were like three of us i worked at collins clothes i was a uh, clothing salesman there and uh the uh spear brothers i think it was called was right across the street from there and there was a lady who worked in there. And there was one other guy that worked up the street, up uh, Avenue of the States. But other than that, there weren't any black folk working in the business area of Chester. I just happened to have worked in uh, Philadelphia as a clothing salesman before I got hired at uh, Collins Clothes. And I was there talking to Mr. Kaplan, who was the owner of the store, and he said, you know what, I like you. I say, you like me? You don't even know me. He says, but I think you make a good clothing salesman. I say, well, I've been selling clothes in Philadelphia for a few years. He said, well, I want you to work for me. So that's how I got, I was hired there and I worked there for a few years before going to work at Boeing Aircraft. But uh, Chester was always good to me. I was never without a job for the whole while I was in Chester if I wanted to work. No matter where I went, I got an interview, except I got hired, except Scott Paper. I went to Scott Paper for, I don't know how long, every day I would show up. at the show up. Let me ask you a question, Lenton. Uh, yes, sir. Your experience in Georgia has led you to become a long-term substitute teacher. Yes. And this isn't one of the questions that I've been prompt to ask, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Go uh, right <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, you know, we're talking about education overall, <laughs> and you've been, you know, doing substitute teaching in, in, the, in the deep south, in, in Atlanta, Georgia, in an area yeah. which is very multi-ethnic. Right. What's the experience like down there, if you were to compare it to the situation that I guess you learned mostly from, from your wife up here in Chester in the 60s. Is there anything to compare or contrast to it? Well, uh, when I started substitute teaching here after retiring from IBM, there was, I mean, it was so, 
diverse, man. They would they would like every every nationality, race, creed, color that you could mention at Sprayberry High School. And uh, there was never any any uh, racial problems. And I worked there for 18 years as a substitute at the same school because it was such an easy job. You know, I, did, I never liked to work a real stressful job. So uh, I was there for that length of time. And, and until the pandemic struck, I was there. But so that, that kind of gives me hope, I don't know about the rest of you, that you can integrate racially a school system and things can go well? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. really? Imagine yes, that. Indeed. And another thing, now I was, I, I was elected mayor of my hometown that's further south in Georgia. And I served two terms there. And I never had any problems there, you know, and, and uh, I guess when they convinced me that they wanted me to run for mayor and I, I couldn't get out of it, there were four guys who had already qualified, had gone through the qualification and all this stuff. But, uh, and when I, I waited till the last week of qualification, I threw my hat in the ring and all four of the guys that had already uh, qualified, they dropped out. So, so I'm, 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 I'm a little, uh, some of the comments had said the story that Jordan, Jordan Smith gave us uh, demonstrated to some for the very first time and to others, it just, just hammered home the point that there was a lot of racial discourse in the North, particularly Chester, which we're talking about today. And just to hear you talk about, you know, moving to Georgia, teaching in a fully integrated school, not just black and white, but black, white, Brazilian, Spanish, and then just about every other nationality known to man. And Absolutely. then being a mayor in the deep South with, uh, in a town with, which I know just has one traffic light, uh, right. you know, a, a Mayberry personified, there's right. no issues there. That's so I want, to bring this, I want to bring this back to Miss Twilight. I was gonna say because I'm sitting here jumping. I know you are. One, I, I say what you want to say, but integrate that with this last question, and then we're going to take questions from the people out there in TV land. How do we get to equity in education in cities like Chester? Education, just like a lot of people on this um, on this uh, Zoom, don't know. That's why we can't teach children because we don't know. And I, even as a self-taught historian, I always need to try and find information and it's not readily available. Um, I got sick and tired of Cheddar Upland, so I resigned. Just Jesse and my mother got together, I went back. Um, I asked for a curriculum. They handed me the curriculum that I had written before I left. You know, it's, it's just kind of been um, a standing joke. And, and as Chris would attest to in his, in his book, Ch Chester's within the Blacks and Chester have been pawns. And we continue to be pawns because we don't quite know all that it takes to move ourselves forward. And a good part of that educating ourselves so that we do know what's going on. And we can then move forward. Because once you figure out some of the things that our ancestors did, it's like, oh, oh, that's how that fits here. Oh, this is how that does this, that, and the other. And when I was doing the um, documentary on Feldman, and I found out how she was, uh, she was essential in the evolution of the West End and any of the things that she it fostered into birth are still there. But most people don't know that. And so until we, as, as a people, I guess, begin to connect and make sure that it's an understanding and there's a curriculum and there's folks and everything, then, then we're not going to be able to get anywhere because we're going to keep shooting ourselves in the foot. Thank you. Well, let me, uh, uh, Stefan, may I say something about the school system? Please do. As far as integrating one against the other, Chester 
comparing it to, say, Spray Bear School. Well, now you got to understand that Spray Bear was not in the city. We had like 2,000 students at this school, and the majority of them were bused in every day. And uh, that took up uh, the problem of, say, going to school where you live. You understand? It wasn't about, uh, okay, you live in this community, you got to go to school in this community. It was a school district of uh, a part of Cobb County. And uh, everyone in that district went to school there, whether you were, like you say, whether you were Brazilian, whether you were Chinese, whatever your ethnicity is, that's where you went to school. So that solved a whole lot of the integration problem. Are you going to be? Are you uh, willing to integrate this school? It wasn't. A, it wasn't about that. It was if you lived anywhere in this district, the bus picked you up and brought you to school. No, well, thank you for that. Well, around here we have school districts too. So Chester is considered a school district. But right. for those of you who might follow me on my blog, I've always hollered that. <laughs> The district needs to be expanded to the county. If we could just right. share resources between schools, uh, things could, if everybody cooperated, put us on a, equal, a more equal footing. We're going to move from you guys. Thank you so much, Linton. Thank you so much, Twyla. We're going to have you back there because we're going to have some questions. But uh, and I had just another third politics there. And until we kind of identify it and make folks understand, we can keep talking. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want you to be done, so just hang in there. So, Erica, we're going to move into that that phase of this uh, this evening where we're going to uh, accept questions from the chat. And Zulene has her hand up; she doesn't even want to type. I don't blame her. So, <laughs> let's let's start with uh, Zulene. Get yourself off of mute and tell us what's on your mind. Um, I, 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 um, I just have an observation and a comment, and I think that, um, I think that um, there's not much difference between the schools then and the schools now. I think that the difference is now is that at one time we, our children were being educated um, because we had those teachers on the block. They knew your mother. They knew your family. If you cut a fool, they cut a fool with you and they got you right and they got you through school. Right now, as it stands, I think that our schools are more segregated than they've ever been. Um, the county has bastardized Chester. Um, the funding is not there. And I think the Delaware County as a whole in southeastern Pennsylvania, and I'll say this every day of my life, owes Chester a big debt because the wealth of Delaware County was built off of the backs of the people of Chester point blank period. Um, I can also say that I find it ironic that schools uh, in the Wallingford School District, Strathaven, uh, uh, Media, all of the schools that are on the outline of Chester, they recruit our athletes. They make it so that the athletes can go to Strathaven High School, run track, play football, uh, play basketball, and yet they don't live in that district. So if that can be done there, why can't we take some of the more um, brilliant minds or, 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 or why can't we have for our children the same standards that are going on in the other school districts? I remember I went to the school one time and the kids were using the same science books I had 20 years ago but they told me that the new books were in the basement somewhere. I'm like, why the hell are they in the basement? Where's the money? Where is this money going at? Where is the money going at? It doesn't need to go to administration anymore. That system of having uh, uh, two staff people for one janitor or two janitors for, and no freaking teachers has to end. And that's all I got to say. Now I'm gonna get off my soapbox, Stefan. So good to see you. Good to see you, sir. Good to see everybody. Erica, hey, Erica. come on, Erica, please take me uh, where, where we want this to go from here. 
Okay. Um, one of the questions um, was, are there any notes on redlining in Chester? Uh, I think there were some resources shared in the chat, um, but I don't know if um, Chris or Jordan want to refer anyone to anyone to any other resources. I read a good book called Race and the Politics of Deception. That <laughs> so that's a good one. If people can find it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think like we've talked a lot about school, like school districting and, and kind of boundaries, both within kind of the Chester School District in the 60s, but also um, like those boundaries of schools aren't natural. Like they're created by kind of human dynamics. Um, and so I think obviously we want to kind of think about how redlining and how housing affected um, kind of the segregation of these schools. Um, the next question was, uh, do you know what was going on in Wilmington, Delaware during this period? Whoever wants to answer that. <laughs> That's Chris's turf. <laughs> Still with us. Okay. I assign, I ass, there is an article on this and I can kind of look it up um, about kind of schools in, in Wilmington because I think Wilmington, like many of these cities, was kind of um, dealing with similar questions of, of kind of how catchments of the schools would be um, uh, kind of determined. Um, but that's the extent of what I have on the tip of my tongue. Mm -hmm. Um, someone asked where the photo, um, uh, Twyla, the photo you held up of Malcolm X, um, Stanley Branch, Dick Gregory, and, um, when they spoke in Chester, can you, um, mention where the location of that photo was and you're on mute. So hold on, you're on mute. Okay. There you go. Okay. Um, if you go to the street. In Carlin, heading to Tuesday, off on the left hand side, there was an old Masonic Lodge. Um, it's actually between Tuesday and George Street. Oh, any of you from um, Chester Night Owls? It's, it's right by Night Owls. It's kind of in that, in that one or two block area, and that's where it was taken. It's just the shell right now. Um, the front of the building is there, but then it's back. There's no, there's nothing. And that's where the picture was taken. And uh, that picture is in the Smithsonian. And that is also on Google. Uh, right off the top of my head, I'm not remembering the other two people, but you can not Google. Just put Stanley Branch and Malcolm and that picture will pop up. Yeah. So for those of you who had trouble hearing her, she said it's on Third Street near Curlin. Uh, an old Masonic hall. I just rode by there the other day and every time I ride by it just saddens me to see the building still standing in the state it's been since I was a little boy. They had a, a, a tragic fire. Uh, it, it just destroyed the shell of the building but it was a, a it's a gray big brick building and that gray not gray brick gray stone and that doesn't go anywhere and it's still there. It almost looks like a movie set. It's just got that facade. And uh, yeah. it's, it's kind of tragic to see how long it's been 40 years since the fire, maybe Twyla. Um, I don't, a long time, it's long been time. that long. And that I, I didn't know that's where the picture was taken, though. So thanks for sharing that. That was that's mm -hmm. good stuff. And I have a, I have a big piece of step because it's really falling apart, and it's, it's going to be completely demolished soon. Uh, another question from Liz in the chat is, um, are there any groups currently working on redesigning school district boundaries or the like? I'm not sure who wants to try to answer that or if anyone knows. Um, I think because the Chester Upland School District is in the state that it's in, um, it's still to be determined because they're not sure what they're going to do with it. And right now it's very, very close to being privatized. Um, but again, if you look at the history of the school district, um, you know, it's been safe for a long time and it always, go, always goes to the highest there. And unfortunately, we recycle um, ideas, administrators and everything. 
And that's why the heart chapter stays as it is. Okay. Um, and then I guess there was a question back about which police were involved during the protests and when the state police got involved. Just wanted to tell a story about that. Chris, throw that to you. Yeah, so uh, in the spring, the in March, it was mostly the Chester police force. And then the uh, uh, blue of, of folks, uh, trash collectors, the folks working in the, um, you know, taking care of dogs and parks and everything else uh, were deputized to assist in uh, managing, so to speak, the protests. State police came in. Um, one of the events that George mentioned at when the protesters approached the police department, uh, the Chester Police Department uh, building, um, unbeknownst to the protesters, the state police had entered in that evening and were hiding in the building. And when the protesters approached, they swung open the doors and came out and with the you know batons uh, swinging. And that was a, a big event that was mentioned also in the human relations report. The Bull Moose Bar incident also was the state police uh, where folks were in a bar um, having drinks and listening to music and the police came in and um, dragged a number of them out on the street and beat them. So it was mostly police, but then uh, state police folks uh, came in um, at the tail end. That uh, last night, that biggest event the, of the police department and Bull Moose was really the kind of a point in which the PA government at the time said, okay, we need to uh, put a stop to this. I would say, I would just add that when you, when you have a chance to look at the photographs again, you can see the difference between the uniforms um, and you'll wreck the state police uniforms look like the state police uniforms look like today. Um, so um, you're able to actually kind of uh, use kind of the visual evidence to help you tell that story as well. I see in the chat, uh, who is it? Diane Noel? She had, nope. Go up a little more, a little more. Susan Duncan, thank you. She uh, submitted the link to the Forbes article that came out just recently. I guess that's January 15th, if I were to steal it off the, the URL. That article is a fascinating compilation of, of Chester School District history with a lot of focus on um, its... The, the politics involved, the financial uh, situation that it's in, in, uh, in, in pretty much a chronolo chronological order. So you can, as you read through the article, it's, it's, it's really compelling because you just, <laughs> the further you get through the article, the, the, the more troubling the story becomes. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to Ms. Twyla's point of, you know, we're to the point now of just seeing a school district that's practically being totally uh, privatized. Also to Ms. Twyla's point that isn't mentioned in that article and is hardly mentioned anywhere with regard to Chester School District um, information <laughs> is just how great the, the children, the school, the school educated their, their students. Uh, there's the, just recently Did Delaware- Douglas? Well, the Delaware County Daily Times just did an article. It was a front page article. It was an excellent article on the 50 year anniversary of the Chester High School fire. And they quoted several of the students from the class of 71. And one of the quotes was at the time that they were in school in 1971, it was a 95% graduation rate. And I think the number was 85% of the students went on to some type of higher education. Uh, if, uh, what's the numbers today, Twyla? What's the... Uh, What's the graduation? Um, I, I don't, I don't know. Since I retired, I really haven't, haven't kept up with it. But I'd just like to interject that that was right around the time after the high school burned down. Uh, the, the paper is talking about, I think they were 10th graders. I was in 11th grade then. Um, 
but so much happened. And like you were talking about with desegregation, there were great teachers throughout, but their loyalty to, to their students just, just depended. And fortunately, Douglas was one of those schools where you, if you go there, you're going to get. And that's what memory is for so many people because those teachers were just so, so adamant about children getting an education. And I'd just like to add when I was doing the research on uh, Ruth L. Bennett, um, it coincided with something that a student of mine gave me about the Dunbar Society in Chester High School. Miss Bennett made sure that there was Black history posters in almost every school that she could put them in. And by the time children got to the high school, the only club they joined was Dunbar Society. So I finally found out what the Dunbar Society is. And it called on Dunbar, and that was really the only class. And according to limited information on it, they gave them a party at the end of the year. And that was the extent of the activity for aside from sports for many of the um for many of the students again this is back um maybe in in the, in the 50s and, and, and early 60s but a lot of it was still kind of happening uh when, when i was there and it was in the late 60s because i came out of here nine one of the things that chris mentions in his in his book about the profession of of teaching was that it was a great middle class job you know, you, you got a, a good salary for being a teacher. At that time, 60s, probably 50s, 60s, 70s, a lot of Chester students chose teaching as a profession because there wasn't a lot of choice. And not too far away was one of the greatest teaching universities around, and that was, a, you know, Cheney University. So we had a lot of Chester high school graduates go to Cheney with the full intent of bringing that knowledge back to the city and teaching, you know, in the city. So that, that cycle of being a Chester student, going to a college just 15 miles away, getting a great teacher's education, and then coming back to the city to, 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 to have very long careers, uh, boded well, you know, for our city for a very long time. That whole system is absolutely broken right now. Well, I just want to add, too, that my mother told me I go to college anywhere in the United States except Westchester because she found it just to be so, so very prejudiced. And then, again, family from Miss Powell, my mother, Miss Powell, a few other women, met someone from the old girl's wife who got them in Westchester. So, again, just so much history to be explored. And although um, she graduated, she kind of had to get in line because really uh, there weren't just that or weren't that many jobs at that time, which was the early 50s, because segregation was still in place. So she then went back to school at Temple to become an elementary school. So she went to school for fifth ed. So again, it's just so much. I'm just fearful that we'll lose our elders before the stories are captured. Gotcha. Erica, help me out. What's next? Okay. Um, we got like 10 minutes left for questions. Um, did we, did, did the construction of I-95 play any role in questions, issues relating to desegregation in terms of dividing neighborhoods or determining where students will go? Um, so, so um, so I guess I can start. Um, so one of the things that was really interesting for me was there's a series of oral histories, kind of interviews taken in the 1970s from residents of Chester um, that um, are that I was listening to, and I heard people talk about again within the segregated school district having to go to schools in different parts of the city, and these were stories of kind of growing up in the 30s in the schools. Um, and I, if I remember correctly, and others can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, where I-95 goes um, was also, there are also railroad tracks, um, which are older than I-95. Um, um, there always was a divide in the city. And this woman that I'm thinking about talks about, Lewis Hunt, Lois Hunt um, talks about crossing those railroad tracks and then being a divide. But obviously the kind of construction of a highway exacerbated the issues associated with that even more. 
Mm -hmm. Well, and I was going to add, I'm not sure so much about the educational part of it, but um, I was in middle school um, or high school, and Senator Bell came to the school to do an assembly and talking about the blue roof. And I was in middle school in the late 50s, early 60s. So to think the blue roof uh, was being banned even then. So it's just really, really scary that plans are being made 50, 60, 70 years out. So tr you know, try to keep up with that. But ultimately, it, it cut across certain cities. Uh, if you think about it, there used to be X's coming through the city. And those X were removed. And then when the casino came, X's were put back. So oftentimes, they, people weren't even consulted. They didn't even vote on it. It just kind of happened. And so if you look at it now, there are roofs, there are egress that you can come in and get down to 291, get to the casino. And then you can get right back on and spur the city and go wherever you're going. So I just think that master plan is, is very much still in place. And until people really peep it and then start making corrections to changing it, then we'll still have this conundrum. Let's hear from Noble Thompson. Oh, we got to ask him to unmute. Huh? He's looking for it. There he is. There he is. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Um, I grew up in Chester. Um, I, I, I was born in 1942 and, and I'm the product of segregated schools in Chester. I went to Booger T. Washington Elementary School and then on to Douglas. Um, and that this was all segregated. And then I went to Chester High, which was integrated. Uh, many of our facilities in the, in the segregated schools were inferior, but we had some wonderful black teachers who realized that we as students had a tough road to hoe, and they tried to give us everything that we could. In high school, we had some excellent teachers too. Uh, uh, Dr. Leah Jordan, who was my English teacher, I think about her every day. She was just so instrumental in teaching me the things I needed to know, and I excelled in, in college on the strength of, of, of my teachers in, in Chester. I wasn't really aware as a kid growing up in the 40s and 50s that Chester was really segregated. My parents were very protective. Uh, I, I knew that certain restaurants we could not go to, for instance, Schuster's, but I wasn't quite sure why, but we didn't have a lot of money. So going out for dinner was not something that would have, we would have done. But I do remember very clearly the YMCA. Um, you know, Stanley Branch was mentioned and, and he was very instrumental uh, in, in the early 60s in the desegregation effort. And this was conducted in the West Branch YMCA, which was black. The Central Y, which was over on, I think, 9th Street, or uh, I, I think at the time was segregated. And they had the swimming pool. And every summer in Chester Creek, several black kids drowned trying to swim in the creek. Um, right. This was a problem and the YMCA would not allow us black students, kids, to use their pool. And there were no public pools in the black community. The YWCA on 7th Street opened, Seven. up, opened mm -hmm. its pool to us every Saturday afternoon for a couple of hours so that we could lose it. Um, and that was a turning point. Um, I also remember I used to love to sing. I love music. The citywide singing festival. This was a integrated affair. Students from all other schools, black schools and white schools, all came together um, and got together um, to sing. I talk about a lot of this on my, my memoir. Never did. But Chester, Chester for me was a very positive place. I've done a lot of speaking in inner city uh, schools and, uh, and mentoring programs. And I always tell people with pride that I am from Chester. I think it was mentioned earlier, how do we go forward? How do we move out of this? And I, I, I agree um, that um, the comment made that education is the way, education. But, but I must also add, what are we educating? I remember in maybe elementary school or junior high school, 
Mm -hmm. Teachers ask, who can tell me about the Emancipation Proclamation? Raise your hand. No hands went up. And she said, mm -hmm. you can't tell me about the Emancipation Proclamation? We did not know what it was. And, and, and she told mm -hmm. us about it. The problem, education, oh, the problem, are we, what are we educating? We have, to, we have to have a truth and reconciliation and this process. And it has to extend not just in Chester, but all these outlying school districts too. The students must be taught that black history is American history. And until we teach what has happened, I think it's gonna be very, very difficult to, to go forward. Um, I thank you for this, uh, this time. I think this was a wonderful opportunity. Thank you very much. Okay, Mr. Thompson, Twyla Simmons. Um, yes. I now have, I have the girls why Yes. It, it's now the Yes Center. Oh. And yeah. I did a documentary when it was in, you know, when it was integrated and I have the papers and all of that. So Wonderful. please, um, please drop your, your information in the in the chat. I would love to speak with you further. Okay, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Thank you for those comments, Mr. Thompson. That was fabulous. Where are we, Erica? So um, someone brought up, um, how can a group of individuals here continue this conversation on this topic and contribute to this community? Um, and I think it ties into the Chester Digital Storytelling Project and the greater vision for uh, that. So I know we talked about it in the beginning a little bit, but if people want to follow, uh, I think it'd be a good time to do a plug on that, on that project. Uh, I know you're passing it to me and I'm going to pass it right to Chris. Okay, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, this is his, for those of you who don't know, this is his brainchild. He brought this idea to Chester and we have learned uh, from him what this storytelling is all about. And we weren't easy converts either, but now we understand what it's all about and the power and no one can explain it better than Chris uh, Mele. Chris, give it to us. Sure. Uh, uh, we would be, Greatly appreciative of, uh, are you hearing me well? Because I'm getting a bit of feedback. You're okay. good. Okay. Good. Uh, yeah, you're good. Yeah. If you uh, would be willing to share, all of you, uh, your stories and memories and uh, any other information on this, we would be uh, very happy to uh, be in touch with you. And um, again, um, you can reach out to us at uh, uh, if you go to chestermade.org, you'll see a storytelling uh, link that will um, bring you to more information about it. And also some of the early stories, including Stefan and Twyla's that are posted on that website, chestermade.org. Um, so what is this project all about? It's very simple. Um, what we're doing is taking the magic of uh, contemporary technology to be able to record uh, using our mobile phones uh, primarily, uh, to get folks to contribute stories about whatever is on their mind. Uh, it doesn't have to be the past. It could be things that are going on in the present as well. And so what we're doing is uh, developing a way not to just collect these stories and then they just sort of sit somewhere um, or disappear, even worse. Uh, what we're trying to do is create an initiative of how to share these stories amongst people in the community and the general public. And so what we're doing is creating this kind of digital uh, archive, a digital repository of stories. And we're gonna work with partners, uh, some of whom here tonight, um, around story-based story ideas as well, like the civil rights movement in the 1960s or the effort at desegregation. So they're kind of topical and folks can contribute stories uh, as well in that vein. But for the most part, we've just started. Uh, we have some pilot stories posted we're developing the kind of infrastructure architecturally, the, the digital technology to be used to again collect these stories, preserve them, and then to push them out to the community and the, well, the rest of the world. The whole idea behind this is that, and I'm sure many can relate to this, that Chester has been studied to death mm. by uh, communities and, and oh, sorry, institutions, including my own, and I put myself in there as well, I'm not an, exce an exception, uh, has been studied to death. Uh, people come in, they write their books, they write their articles, and then they leave. Uh, the whole idea of this, it really uh, comes from, sorry if I go off on a tangent here, but I'll be quick, uh, comes from 
uh, indigenous populations in Canada and in Northwest United States that were in a similar fashion, tired of being uh, treated as kind of research objects without having any kind of input that was lasting. So this is in, es in essence in a way to kind of flip the narrative rather than researchers coming in and grabbing stories and leaving. What we're gonna to try to do here is to allow for the community to own the stories, keep them and, and build a repository so that as Twyla was mentioning, curriculum development in the Chester school system that really doesn't talk about Chester history, there's some material there that could be used for developing curriculum around, for example, again, civil rights or desegregation or the educational system at large. So this is a, a, a project that is, is gonna be continuing for a number of years. Um, my role really is to just facilitate. I don't have a, and, and I don't think any of us do on the Chester Advisory Board as well, uh, an agenda as to what kind of stories. We're kind, our philosophy, if there is one, Stefan, maybe we can have this as our philosophies. We'll take all stories. We don't really have, uh, that's the best part about digital technology is that we don't have to be, you know, okay, we can only take so many, we can take them all. And so what we're trying to do here is cast a wide net and capture as many memories, experiences, and ideas about Chester, living in Chester, uh, dealing with a number of issues that we even talked about tonight and having a perspective from the ground up as opposed to, again, from the outside looking in. Excellent. Wow. I'm going to learn how to give that presentation. Chris. Um, I'll just add on to that. I put into the chat, um, we are expanding on our digital resources and we put together a civil rights uh, page on our website. So uh, there are links to articles and um, some of the other information that is available. Um, the, the oral histories project that Jordan mentioned, we do have original cassette tapes recordings at CCHS. So we are going to work on uh, digitizing those um, tapes. So um, yeah, we'll, we will be continuing to expand on that. And uh, I wanted to just thank all of our, our panelists tonight. Um, I think that there might be another question in the chat. Um, Stefan, did you see? No, I didn't. But there's some great information in the chat. And for those of you who are not real Zoom savvy, if you kind of fiddle your mouse, there's these three dots or the file button. You can save the entire chat. It ends up going on your uh, hard drive under a folder that it creates all by itself called Zoom. So you can literally save this entire chat because there's some phenomenal stuff on here. Are we saving the chat, Erica? Yes, we are. Okay, we're saving the chat. Yeah, so. and this uh, recording will be of this event will be on our website as well as part of this, uh, this digital archives. Um, so, and uh, we will be sending a survey um, following the event um, for feedback uh, and collecting also memories or testimonies too that you would like to add to our archive. Um, and ways in which um, we can further this conversation if we're interested in hosting another conversation about Chester history, um, that would be great. Thank you. Laurie, did you wanna say anything? <laughs> Our director? Uh, yes, I would just like to thank you, Erica and Stefan uh, for organizing this conversation. Um, and to our panelists, we thank you. And to all of you who attended, uh, we thank you as well. And please consider this um, conversation number one to be continued. Um, we plan to host more of these conversations until we can see you in person. Um, please be patient with our technical difficulties. We're, we're new at this. Um, and bringing in 100 participants and trying to hear everyone and give everyone their voice is, is new to us. Um, but I think the bottom line is why we're doing this. We're, we're doing this because we want to make history relevant to Delaware County residents' lives. We want them to think 
of history as a continuum. And truly, um, our youth are losing out if we do not bring this to light and teach them the truth um, of history. A lot of history has been masked and there's many views in history. Um, and Delaware County tries to be the platform to present them all. And um, we hope that we can do this again. And we hope that you'll tune in again. And thank you for sharing your stories and your information. And we hope to see you again. Well, what a perfect way to close. Thank you to our executive director, Laurie Grant, for those closing words. As your moderator, it's been a pleasure. Uh, being in front of you. I hope we move this thing. We're even letting you go home early. I think I've, at last, I think we had 101 people tune in. That's amazing. I mean, we, 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 every program we do, we pack the house and now we pack the Zoom house. So that's great. I see about 70 people on about now. So I guess a few people's meters were running out and they had to go. But for 70, 70 of you to hang on to the end just means that we really, we really hit it. We nailed it. We got a topic that people are really interested in. Your chat uh, the chat is full of comments. The contributions many of you made was phenomenal. Our panelists were superb. Um, we knocked this one out the park, not just for us, but for you. So like Lori said, we're gonna to continue to do this. We're gonna to continue to plan to continue to bring the best people who are very knowledgeable on the topics that uh, you guys wanna hear with regard to Delaware County. So thank you all for joining us tonight. We look forward to seeing you in the future. Please stay in touch. We will. And Good. thank you so much for inviting me. All the way That's down in Atlanta. Wow. All the way. <laughs> Thanks. We're here live. We're live. <laughs> We've seen you somewhere before. I don't know where, but- uh... I don't know where I've seen you either, but I've seen you someplace. <laughs> Good night to everybody. Good night. <laughs> Len, did you get your uh, your package from Berman's? Today. <laughs> okay. It came in the mail today, and I want to thank you. Good. I was like, I need to help him out. He's on my event. <laughs> I'm glad. Yeah, it's. I know it's been crazy with the, with the snow. But um, yeah, when you're in Chester, you, gotta, you can stop, stop by. I certainly will. I certainly will. And I... I until this uh, virus thing hit, I was there quite often. I have a daughter and three grandchildren there. Mm -hmm. And I haven't seen them in over a year now. Oh, wow, yeah. Well, come on back when, when things open up again. I will, I'm, I'm coming if it doesn't open up. I'm coming <laughs> soon. Okay. As soon as school is out, I'm coming up there and hang out with you. Good. Good, good. Okay, I'm going to end the meeting. Um, save the chats. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Bye, Lenton. Bye-bye. <laughs>